email of recent of yes i did uh, a couple of hours ago uh, okay. yeah i got I, it i don't i don't think i read your your email yet what, what was it about uh our replication it's yeah, it's his notes yeah Very oh cool. so oh, that's something we'll definitely have to look at yeah let me see if i can find it Can y'all hear me? Yeah, I hear you. My, I don't think my camera is showing me. <laughs> I don't see myself. So you got a video game on there or something? Well, I've yeah, got more some like other, the backyard. I've got some other. I got another video running running in the background because I've got a package coming out signed for that the watch for the guy. It could be interfering with the, uh, but it looks like it's working. It's just not showing me. Uh, let me turn this other one off here and see what happens. Um, George, where was the email sent to? Uh, well, I'll check. I mean, did everyone else get it? I mean, it was sent to the Falcon Space Program at Gmail. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Todd. Oh, I'm looking there right now. I don't see. I don't see the email. Let's check your spam. Oh, there yeah. it is. Yeah, it's in spam. Mm. Or not spam. Okay. Well, I don't know why it's not showing me. It's pointing right at me. <laughs> but I yeah. do have a package coming in. I have to sign for it. So if they show up, I'll have to go down and do that. But right now, we can at least talk. Yeah, I don't have a whole lot of time. Uh, maybe oh, okay. 40 minutes I'm just trying back. to trying to find uh your okay the email from you oh i see what it's doing let's do hey george how big in like scale are those van de graaff generator balls uh the balls are uh, as far as i recall uh, 50 centimeters so hmm. about like that, uh, which if you calculate is rated at about 600 kV, but uh, if you actually test it, uh, which is difficult to do, it'll be down around 300, maybe 400, depending on the humidity um, and, uh, and some other factors too. So okay. you, can never, uh, you, you can never tell exactly what the voltage of a Van de Graaff machine is when running at peak capacity, unless you test it. The only way yeah. to test it is with a very high voltage uh, voltage divider. Uh, very low impedance, obviously. Uh, fortunately, we have one. Um, there we go. Anyway, that's about the size of it. OK. Uh, Todd, can you forward me that email from George, uh, the, the one with his uh, meeting notes? his notes from the experiment I, it went to it went to spam and then it disappeared <laughs> oh i could do it myself but it looks like todd's got it up I, i'm here i got it okay so basically we're trying to go over um what george did in his last experiment uh, uh trying to replicate this thing tony you've spoken to podklinov as well and oh there's is that a superconductor? It's a two layer. It started out being two inches, but it shrunk. It's also bowed. So it, it would have to be machined uh, flat if, or either adapt to it. Still has the seat on it. They're gonna need to pop it off, but it's, uh, I don't know how well you can see it, but you can see the crystals through the, through, through the whole thing. From top okay, to well. We have a, a little adapter over here that we machined down. Um, this, is, this is going to be the feed point for the um, liquid nitrogen. And at the end is a block of silver. 
and we can put the superconductor right on there. It's going to go through these. I've got these machinable plates. They're, they're covered in cardboard right now for when we machine them, but they're really acrylic, so it will be see-through. This is going to punch right through it. Then we'll have a superconductor on the end over here for the, um, the output. Um, and we, we hope to try this with first our megavolt March generator. And then there's a company up in New Hampshire that has a 2.4 million, 200 kiloamp uh, March generator bank that it's willing to play ball with us to, um, you know, push it to the limits. But and email me your address and I'll send it to you. Thank you so, so much. Also, thanks, Tony. Got, thanks, Tony. We've got these massive Helmholtz coils over here that are going to apply a um, basically a homogeneous magnetic field across the length of the uh, distance that that the impulse is traveling. And um, on the other end, we'll have another plate with the vacuum ports and the grounding plane and all that. And then there'll be stand-ups inside the system that will allow us to move the distance, change the distance between the grounding plate and the emitter. Um, this entire thing is going to be facing towards the ground slightly. This way you can pour the liquid nitrogen and it actually stays in there. And then there'll be sensors on the ground that will be sensing any potential impulse. We also have a high speed camera capable of 1.4 million frames per second with a trigger that we're going to use to capture that moment and see if there's any impulses. Uh, we may be able to see stuff that are going faster than a light at that distance if we get the <laughs> camera far enough away. Oh, really? Um, point nine? No, no. no, I don't think so. No. Nope. Forget it. Anyway, no, not at 1.4 million frames? Oh, yeah. No, 1.4 trillion or so. Yeah. Even if, yeah. even if you're like 50 feet there back. There is a camera that can do it, but no, forget there's it. There's a camera up in uh, in Massachusetts that can do it, right? And uh, yeah. Oh, yeah. There but, are some in universities that uh, look at femtosecond uh, mm -hmm. distances. They're uh, going through the bottle and all that. Yeah. Yeah, but anyway, can I uh, make a couple of comments? Please, uh, sure. Please, that's what we're here for. Uh, and and I too have uh, met. Uh, put, uh, in fact, I invited uh, the first first person to invite him over to North America back in uh, the early '90s, I guess it was, or mid '90s. Um, on two occasions, he came to the lab, and he okayed our uh, bilayer formulations. Um, one of which I guess uh, Tony was holding up, or the type that Tony was holding up. So uh, we had uh, a, a pretty clear mandate uh, from Podkletnov with regard to the gravity beam experiment. I'm not talking about the spinning disk experiment, which we published in Physica C um, a while ago, uh, but the beam experiment. Um, and as you'll read in the uh, our, uh, that that uh, text that I sent. Um, there, there actually were about five different um, instantiations, you might say, of the gravity beam experiment, all of which showed an amazing, uh, remarkable uh, force experiment, a uh, force effect. And it, it ranged from a, the, a very simple 200 kV uh, high school size uh, uh, Van de Graaff machine in a bell jar uh, facing a, uh, with, with a, a superconductor basically pasted on it. And that's one thing I want to talk about. Pasted on the dome. And then uh, at the, and this was in a bell jar. And then the side of the bell jar was a grounded disc uh, with a hole in the center. And at, at 200 kV, that was the quote, that was the calculated voltage of the Van de Graaff would never get there, but uh, the calculated voltage of 200 kV, he was able, he claimed to knock pencils over and uh, do that kind of stuff at, at right across the lab. Hmm. Uh, that, that, and this was when he spoke in Turin uh, back, uh, I got it in the notes in, uh, in the 90s. I went to visit uh, Modeneza and uh, a bunch of other guys who were working on the Podkletnov situation, and uh, and Podkletnov was there, um, showing the various um, versions of his device. Oh, so quick question. Yeah, how was it attached to the uh, 
than to graph generator. Exactly. Was it like exactly. was it was it bonded like with with uh, bolts or with a uh, indium or he, epoxy? Um, as far as I could tell, it was a, a conductive epoxy, hmm. and that's what I was going to bring up uh, to Mark. Um, it's really important to have a not only electrically conductive but a, a thermally conductive, which is usually the case, uh, bonding method um, to bond the superconductor to the to your um, uh, silver uh, silver end there. Uh, so that you have um, a, a, as, as uniform as possible a, uh, a, a super a Meisner effect uh, rather than having it only in center and then it drifts off and it's no, no longer superconducting on the rim um, or things like that. So uh, he suggested that uh, a very tight uh, contact between the superconductor and the Van de Graaff or whatever uh, at the, the time was Van de Graaff when he talked about it the first time, then it became somewhat more sophisticated. Uh, but anyway, you needed that, that really uh, a tight connection. He also, at the, in his first, uh, first experiments, never talked about um, uh, a, a bilayer disc. Uh, that happened subsequently. Uh, as people talked and pestered him about questions during the conference, he would alter things um, and uh, sort of improve them as people started asking questions about, you know, how high was your vacuum? Well, we started off with a bell jar and basically, you know, it was a, a four pump vacuum as far as we could tell, uh, as far as I could tell from listening to what he, his description was. Um, don't forget, he's a material scientist. He's not a physicist. So uh, he wasn't always uh, up with uh, all of the details that you might be, you might expect him to be when he claimed to have been in control of the whole experiment. <laughs> um, in any event, he, uh, he then said, you know, it was, it was four pump vacuum, but then eventually we went on to uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, a, um, uh, so, uh, a, 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 not a mercury vapor pump, but uh, something similar. It was almost like that. Ten, getting diffusion down to, pump? Sorry? Is it, would that be a diffusion pump? Uh, it, it, I assumed it was going to be an oil diffusion pump, but he was a bit waffly on that. Um, mm. He never said exactly, as far as I can remember, what the vacuum was that he needed to get down to. It was 10 to minus four, 10 to minus five, 10 to minus six. It was 10 to minus six. That's the uh, sort of the bottom end of a uh, good diffusion pump. Then you have to go into uh, ion pumps and things like that, which he never had. Is, I'm damn sure of that. My assumption was that in the bell jar, he got pretty good four pump vacuum, 10 to minus four, if you're really lucky. Um, I don't, I don't know whether he had any cleaners or, uh, you know, uh, 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 backflow preventers that would prevent uh, the oil from a diffusion, even either, either a diffusion pump or which would be a nitrogen trap or a, uh, a four pump, which is a uh, zeolite uh, to prevent junk coming back up as it always does uh, from a four pump back into your vacu evacuated space. Uh, as we talked about that, uh, things got a little more sophisticated. Oh yeah, well then the next experiment we did was it was in a tube, and we had uh, uh, a uh, you know evacuated tube, not in a bell jar, and we had the the Van de Graaff machine outside the tube, as hmm. more or less in, in what I've done, but less sophisticated. Um, he he, uh, he claimed that uh, they cooled it in an odd way through. Uh, cooled the superconductor through some means that he didn't really describe, um, and that uh, the the disc was outside the vacuum system, didn't have to be inside the vacuum system. Then he went on to another uh, another uh, version, which is closer to what uh, most people know and what uh, uh, I tried to do, um, which is seen in the in my little report there. Uh, and then after 
we did some experimentation. He came up with several other versions, um, include increasing the voltage every time. So he went from a, a arguably a 200 kV Van de Graaff machine to a 500 kV Van de Graaff machine to two Van de Graaffs to an, a Marx generator uh, at a million volts or whatever it was. It was a megajoule, it said in the paper. Uh, megajoule or, yeah, so, which is- Megajoule or megavolt, yeah. yeah. It could have been a millijoule, but it was a capital MJ. <laughs> yeah, it, it, it was monstrous. Um, and each time, uh, as far as I recall, his, his effect got a little bit more pronounced. Like at first it was dropping pencils over, then it was um, moving objects like books sliding along a table. How he managed to aim it so the table didn't move as well. Um, then it was um, uh, an actual force gauge uh, that he could position around. Uh, I presume it was a capacitive force gauge or something like that, or a, a, a crystal, like a, a quartz force gauge. Um, and that was farther and farther out. And then he found, gee, uh, after the, about the fourth iteration, I can put the force gauge behind this concrete wall and I still get the effect when I get it in the right spot. Hmm. Um, and then finally, it was uh, what we see now, which is uh, uh, you know, a, a serious uh, anti-gravitational effect or, or a serious inertial effect on massive objects. Uh, or at least the latest thing he, uh, uh, he, he produced, which is now decades old. Um, so my, my point really is that there is no set uh, true Pakletnov gravity beam apparatus. There's no single set gravity beam apparatus, according to his own descriptions both at Turin and after, and while we were doing our experiments. It's a moving target, yeah. Yeah, uh, it, 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 it was a moving target. And, uh, you know, what, once again, no corroboration. Uh, in this case, as far as I recall, he didn't even use the excuse that the military didn't want him uh, telling anybody about this or uh, probing it or how the actual details were as, he did with the spinning disc experiment. Um, so I, I'm in the dark about the veracity of the experiment uh, and the conclusions uh, and the claims. Uh, my only, uh, my knowledge is that when we set up an experiment, according to his, at least his um, fourth or fifth iteration, uh, we did not see an effect up to what would be probably seven or eight kV between anode and cathode um, using a uh, high vacuum. As you can see in the picture at the bottom of the, of the uh, report, uh, if you got down that far, uh, you'll see that we were using a, uh, uh, a turbo pump, uh, a fairly substantial one. Um, and uh, we knew what kind of vacuum we were getting. We had the glassware specially made. Um, and uh, we had a, uh, an enclosed uh, uh, nitrogen, liquid nitrogen uh, uh, manifold, I guess. And we were able to, because we were able to make our own superconductors uh, at the lab, uh, we were able to drill a, a little hole in the center which, through which we put a plastic uh, flathead screw, quarter 20, up against the the uh, brass end of the liquid nitrogen container. And that held it in place uh, in addition to uh, uh, the um, conductive paste that we used. We used a couple of pastes, um, including uh, Apiazon. Uh, their, uh, uh, their uh, let me see, it was a conductive, um, conductive grease that was high, uh, capable of, of uh, high vacuum, which is most Apiazon products. 
So the other thing that you have to be aware of is that if you just use any old um, glue uh, that uh, you think will be conductive and keep the superconductor glued to the uh, to the liquid nitrogen container, uh, if you're going to go to pretty high vacuums and the thing gets a little hot too, um, you have to do some tests beforehand to make sure that the superconductor doesn't slide off uh, at the uh, end of the uh, of your silver um, yeah. thing uh, due to uh, the uh, the glue or the epoxy breaking down. In I, know, I know of some epoxy with silver in it. Yes. Yeah. Conductive. Good yeah. Thermal, uh, yeah. yeah. But it, all of these things are uh, they they generally don't say yeah we can withstand high voltage yeah there's going to be a high voltage across there we can also withstand a little heat we can also withstand a high vacuum uh and uh without With nitrogen yeah. and and then a low temperature uh as i say when i say heat that's when it's we got this epoxy for it. it this is capable of uh, cryogenic temperatures in a vacuum yeah, yeah okay but, but is it conductive nothing. Uh, it is not conductive. So what you we're add, thinking of doing add is powder to it. No, what we're thinking of doing is just using it as a way of holding it in place and machining out the shape of the superconductor in here, pressing it in so it would be like a direct contact fit, and then surrounding mm. that with the epoxy on just on the outside of the superconductor to hold it in place. Makes sense. Yeah, okay. Uh, it's also it's not, I, I don't know whether it's as important to have a. 100% conduct, uh, con conductivity, because if there's going to be a field effect, I mean, this, uh, the, depending on how you design it, I mean, your, your design of a, a basically a uh, cylinder of, of uh, uh, silver is going to have at many kV, I presume, a, an electric field that surrounds it. That electric field is going to, by nature and uh, of, uh, of course, surround the superconductor as well. And the superconductor is going to be more or less, because of the electric field that it sits in, more or less the same potential as the uh, silver thing. So I wouldn't, I, I don't know, but I wouldn't worry too much about the conductivity, uh, but I would strive to get as much conductivity as possible. Okay. So Mark, maybe, maybe we should make a clamp like a, a, a ring that goes around the superconductor and slightly overlaps it. And then that screws down to the, uh, to the silver head to hold it. Like, because when that is charged up to several KV or whatever, uh, like charges will repel. So there's gonna be a lot of repelling force between the silver head and the superconductor if it's not solidly attached. And uh, it, it, it could pop it right off the glue. That's a possibility. Depends on the, what the field looks like. Yeah. Um, if it's uh, all enclosed in we one. made like a cap, though, that could just yeah. like, yeah. you know, go over it and then screw it down so that it can't pop off. I recommend electroplating the, the, the I recommend electroplating the silver with indium so that you can press it onto the indium initially. And that should remove any indium. Indium uh, breaks down at the cryogenic temperatures. It, oh. um, it cracks. We yes. tried that before. It becomes brittle. I don't know. You said yeah. you said gallium did. Did you try the indium? Uh, I think we tried indium. Because gallium does indium. become. I remember brittle. it was indium, not gallium. Yeah. I'll have to try that myself sometime. I, I remember yeah. we tried something based off of your recommendation. I think it was indium. That was the gallium. Press, you tried gallium first, gallium. then I recommended indium. Yeah, it, it yeah, didn't like stick. literally at, at, right around uh, cryogenic temperature is when it uh when that broke down. Um, that was oh, Jeremiah in thermal expansion right coefficients. I remember. I remember we tried several times and it fell off. <laughs> it didn't stick good. Jeremiah, Jeremiah was, are you there? He he should be joining us right now. There he is. Uh, so, so the issue there is um the uh, the application method. So you would have to have both surfaces coated with a thin layer of indium, and then that would be. Just bring it back idea. and forth next to itself. And then it doesn't attach everywhere. It attaches in some locations. And that is what allows it to what, deform what happened was, with thermal expansion. Uh, 
Um, Jeremiah, do you remember when we connected the two superconductors together using, uh, it was some metal that was melting. I'm not sure if it was indium or gallium, but it would, it, they, they would fall apart right when they hit cryogenic temperatures. That was gallium, right? Jeremiah, Jeremiah, muted. You're Jeremiah muted. you're muted. Yeah. Sorry, I was uh, just getting my, my audio connected. I literally uh, just got up so i have not at all had any chance to prepare i was just gonna listen in the background for a while but got me on the spot right away um uh yeah i believe we we first tried gallium and yeah. we were going to make a uh indium gallium mixture oh but no gallium it's not gonna work either out to... go ahead oh yeah gallium indium is going to be brittle at those temperatures too that you'd have to have the pure indium i know indium is used for cryogenic applications well, we do. We have, we have the pure indium. It's just that we had never uh, mixed the two yeah, together. I thought uh, so. We didn't know the purity of the gallium. I believe it was 99 point, or it was sold as 99.99%. But it, again, the gallium is really expensive. So that's kind of difficult to tell. But either way, yeah, we didn't make that uh, gallon sign or whatever type of metal that was. That's supposed to, I guess, have a better eutectic connection with the surfaces and ultimately that that wouldn't have been anywhere near as good anyways it's just that it was uh like one we mentioned it's far too brittle and uh to the quality of the type 2 superconducting discs and consequent surface was just not sufficient to make any kind of bind even though it seemed to uh, be digging in real nicely really the stuff was connecting with nothing and it was just a matter of oh it's filling the pores now so at this temperature it kind of sort of seems as if it's holding on but it's not really bonding yeah see the issue with so the with the indium it has to be done the proper way and uh it sounds like it wasn't but the i mean yeah, we were working with the gallium true. anyway so the gallium is brittle at those temperatures yeah either way yeah indium more gallium were really not the right solution i think the right solution is is going to be um likely just plating that surface in the vacuum and uh vapor depositing some metal of choice Whatever oh, that's true, because you're in vacuum, so it'll just vacuum weld if you stick it next to each other. All right, now he's got this right. super uh, fancy machine to do it as well, which is something that didn't exist in the minds of, of any of us at the time as far as uh, equipment we thought would be uh, available. Yeah, actually, even just like with the silver, if you, sputter, if you sputter coat the silver onto the back of the, uh, of the super uh, superconducting disc, then that should just... Uh, uh, yeah, under vacuum conditions, those two should vacuum well together now that I think about it. Unlikely, uh, because oh. you won't get a perfectly smooth surface on the superconductor virtually no matter how you try to uh, uh, sputter uh, silver on. It'll always be like this. Yeah, it, it would be, but um, I have seen silver uh, plated on top of superconductors. It works pretty well. I mean, if a, if the if the silver to silver contact would be better than the silver to uh, superconductor contact, it might mm. be a good way to go. Um, it, uh, yeah, uh, there will there will be enough contact, but I think you have a have to have a mechanical uh, press first. Uh, mm. Then the two silver make the two silver surfaces as well together as possible by squeezing or or a, a clamp as as I think Todd was suggesting. Um, yeah, would make sense yeah, yeah. to me, or a screw through the center is what we used. Uh, mm, how okay. are you going to grind the uh, uh, superconductor faces flat when you get them? Uh, well, we have we have some superconductors already that are th these were made in Ukraine, I think, a while back. They are pretty flat already. Okay, we have a CNC too. Yeah, we could face it with the CNC. Yeah, what we did was a diamond wheel on a on a. Uh, oh, that'll do it. On a uh, a, a traveling um, uh, st standard uh, a grinder, a surface grinder. Uh, and yeah, for well. for like jewelry. Really careful. Sorry. Like for like for like. Uh, no, this is carving jewelry. this is the the bed is about four feet long by about a foot wide, uh, and the wheels about this big. Um, and it's adjustable up and down. You got to be really careful when you're grinding, uh, especially how you're holding the superconductor down onto the stable or the, the non-grinding platform. Um, 
which is, uh, and you don't want it to move or buckle or because uh, you'll you'll destroy it. Mm -hmm. uh, and it has to be very slow, very slowly done. At least this this is when we, we were doing. We, we have four of them here. Yeah. We so can, for the we, for the um, for the bolt you mentioned that goes through the middle, uh, was that just kind of like sticking out of the surface, or was that recessed into the surface of the ceramic? Recessed in. Uh, I, it, I figured. Yeah. It was, it was flat. Um, okay. Like the, the surface was the the active surface, you might say, was was essentially flat. Gotcha. So looked, did you like, like fill it? Did you fill it in with a plug above the whole, the? No. No. Oh, okay. Just okay. Yeah. Just plastic. Yeah. We just so. There was a superconductor disc, and there was a little plastic uh, quarter twenty head uh, flathead. Um, I don't think that would make much difference. Um, one, one would hope. So, did you did you get the positive result though? I, I I'm not. No, I haven't read too much about this. So no, we uh, we tried various um, various tests, um, and uh, including the pencil. Uh, system right up as close as we could get to, um, and in, in this case, the as you saw, the Van de Graaffs were on both ends of the two. And Podkletinov claimed, oh, no problem, in version four or something like that, the beam will go right through the one Van de Graaff. Well, we also put the Van de Graaff off the side uh, so that there was basically only the glass uh, of the, of the, um, uh, enclosure, the vacuum enclosure, and inside was the uh, grounded ring or the, the, the low potential ring. We tried both potentials, by the way. Um, and uh, we also aimed it at uh, um, a screen room that we have uh, with a bunch of toilet paper, as it turns out, hanging uh, just inside the, uh, the screen room. And uh, we we got nothing. Um, mm. Yeah. What what was the voltage you used as well? You mentioned it once. I just uh, probably about six hundred um, plus or minus uh, three hundred. So about six hundred kV, six or seven hundred kV across. Um, yeah, it, it was rated at one point two megavolts. If you use the ca calculation, this is a six hundred kV. This is minus six hundred kV. But actually, uh, as I said, uh, you'd probably we were probably lucky to get, uh, say, 500 kV or 600 kV between them. So just because of the breakdown voltages, involved, just the, the breakdown voltage and 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 stray uh, stray currents, uh, that uh, leakage currents and things like that. Um, gotcha. And and so I said we we had to uh, actually use our uh, uh, megavolt. Uh, uh, voltage divider to uh, to confirm that. Mm -hmm. So it, it, was, it was much lower than you would have calculated. And you say, geez, it's not such a, a wet day. It's a fairly dry day. Uh, why isn't the voltage up higher? Well, mm -hmm. that's the, uh, it, it, I mean, our, our Van de Graaffs were homemade. Uh, and, uh, you know, we didn't put uh, Corona rings and things like that. Um, below the dome, as you'll see, they're just on uh, a standard uh, plexiglass or acrylic uh, tubes and the mm -hmm. belt inside. And, you know, there's charge leakage down the inside of the, of the uh, and the outside of the acrylic tubes. Uh, we designed it originally for uh, a megavolt uh, between the two. We never got there. We got maybe 800 in a different, um, yeah, thank you, in a cool. different uh, setup. Okay, cool. So, um, so we could boost the voltage a little further, and, but but he's uh, he claimed results at much lower voltages to begin yes. with, right? Yeah, hmm. and 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 not didn't need two domes. Um, hmm. We just needed, as I said, and I described the original Petkletnov description. I've got it somewhere. Um, the one he first presented at Turin. When he said we got these you know, amazing pencils falling over and um, stuff like that, it's just a 200 kV uh, Van de Graaff, a small one inside a larger bell jar, and the superconductor was pasted onto the the uh, one the, the positive uh, high voltage terminal of the Van de Graaff, and the 
the other terminal went to this uh, ring um, that had a hole in it. And he said, wow, there's this wonderful uh, blue discharge. Well, depending on what gas is in there, if he let gas in, uh, he wouldn't have got a discharge at the lengths that he was talking about. I mean, in that bell jar, as far as I could estimate, the distance between the <laughs> superconductor and the, um, the, the cathode, you might say, uh, ring was on the order of, uh, I don't know, 30 centimeters, something like that. You know, something like this. Uh, I wonder, I would wonder. Fit in to the bell jar. I wonder if he was using an old diffusion pump using mercury, because then that would have mercury vapor in the volume and that yeah. could have a bluish discharge. Yeah, yeah, it could have. Um, um, Tony very... actually mentioned something about that. He thought there might have been helium inside of the chamber for some reason. He, uh, Tony, you want to talk about that? Sure. Let's, let's well, hear from Tony. Off actually told us that. Let me get my camera back up. We had Pekatnov come over somewhere around 2000, 2002 timeframe. And before he even reported the impulse experiment, we brought him over to talk about the uh, rotating one. And he volunteered the information about the impulse experiment. And uh, he told us that they, that when they put the voltage on the superconductor, a, a white cloud formed on top of the superconductor that he thought was helium that had leaked into the chamber because they were cooling it with helium or helium gas. And that that cloud moved, when they released the discharge, it moved across the chamber and hit the grounding plane on the far side and leaving damage mark that was the same size as a superconductor, which to me indicated that the cloud was, was, a, um, was coherent until it hit that uh, grounding plane, which means it could have been a Bose condensate state itself, that cloud. And he volunteered that information. And then he, and then when they wrote that paper, it's, I think it's actually in the paper he talks about that white cloud. Hmm. I would wonder though, because helium three and helium four, like those are both needed for cooling, but the helium four would be the Bose Einstein condensate forming one right have, have no idea i'm repeating what he said we talked to one of the uh nobel prize winners who discovered that helium would form a, a a condensate state and he said the only way that would happen if the pressure on the helium was pretty high hmm. and, and since you do have a very high electrostatic force on it it is very high the pressure on the helium is very high so so this is a well, prize guy who said that, that, that as long as the pressure on it was high, you could probably still form a Bose condensate with helium. Interesting. Maybe maybe the, it wasn't under vacuum then or not under very much. Uh, he, the paper says one one millitor, which is not very low, uh, low at all. You can do that mm. almost with a roughing pump. Yeah. Interesting. George, what do you think of all this? Is that a... Um different from what you heard? That, that's much later. Uh, uh, Tony's involvement was much later uh, than, than our involvement uh, with Pekletnov. And by that time, uh, given the trajectory of the changing uh, uh, descriptions of his apparatus, I could imagine that uh, uh, there would be some different kind of apparatus that he would uh, describe and, and claim that this was the this is the latest version. So, but I, I'm I'm in the dark. I, I don't know anything about uh, the helium issue and the possibility of cooling. Uh, I mean, in that paper, I I, I couldn't quite figure it out. Oh, um, uh, George, you you were working on this experiment before he wrote his paper. Yes, I mean, this was in the in the nineties, um, in the mid nineties. As far as I don't think the paper came out until the late nineties or if we're talking about the same paper. Um, yeah, we started working with Pekletnov and uh, considering his stuff around 1999, I think could have been yeah. a year earlier than that. But I actually started working with Ning Lee about 1995. Yeah, uh, that's when things were hot, as it were. Um, uh, and that's when we were starting, when we were doing, uh, completing our, uh, uh, our 
rotating superconductor experiment and uh, starting to uh, figure whether we should expend the effort to try this gravity beam experiment to his latest, Podkletinov's latest specification, uh, which is what you see in the picture uh, that yeah. uh, I guess Mark I would, flashed up. I would say though, that I'm totally convinced that Podkletinov did not understand his own experiment. I agree. He didn't understand his uh, spinning disc experiment either. Uh, it was clear that he had no idea of uh, the electrical uh, and the magnetic parts of the uh, of the spinning disk experiment. And he admitted it. He said, you know, I'm not an electrical engineer. I let the guys down the hall at Tampere. Uh, they're the electrical guys. I let them set up the, all the magnetic, you know, the, the coils, idea what the coils were, he said. Uh, the, the support coils, I have no idea. Uh, how many turns on the rotating coils. I had no idea. Uh, he admitted it. He said, I'm just the superconductor guy. Ask, ask me about the superconductor, which we did. And he saw how we made it. And he was there while we made our six inch bilayer disc. Yeah. Um, did he have any tips and tricks for making such a large disc? He, he uh, told us that he borrowed that disc from uh, the University of Moscow. He never said he made it. He said he borrowed it. Okay, uh, he he claimed to me that he he uh, he made it. In fact, in fact, in fact, when we had a company out of uh, Illinois or Ohio, I don't remember, they brought Pekutnov on as a consultant, and he spent he had, well they wasted a lot of money making different types of discs for him, and which is the paper that that he did after that used their stuff, the stuff they they made for him. So that tells me that he didn't even know how his superconductor was made. He was having those guys make a whole bunch of different types so that he could write another paper. Yeah, that that uh, that makes sense to me. Uh, although he, you know, he did he he did guide us through the steps um, with what because we're not superconductor experts or we weren't at the time. Uh, so we followed his uh, directions and, you know, we, we made the, a bilayer. One is non-superconductor, one is superconductor. He figured, he told us how to kill the superconductivity and on the one face. Uh, so we had to set up a special uh, jig, uh, a special uh, two-layer can uh, where the, the superconductor was in the center and the bottom had uh, oxygen in it and the top had... Uh, can't remember something. There was prosodymium, etc., in the in the non-superconductor layer, and that had to be under uh, nitrogen as opposed to oxygen, and it killed the superconductivity on the top layer, and it let it, but it was good on the bottom layer. Anyway, he seemed to, for, for, from our standpoint, he seemed to know more or less what he was doing. Um, so by that standard, I suggested to people that we are under his direction for the for, the, for making the superconductor. Um, still, we didn't see anything, uh, at least down our apparatus, um, as you, you may have read. So uh, I'm still, uh, I, I'm, yeah, given what uh, you've described, Tony, it doesn't surprise me, let's put it that way. Mm. Um, that he was going through a bunch of stuff that may have been because no one else was able to replicate what he claimed to have done with his superconductor or Moscow's. So, gee, maybe I should think about making a different one. So I'll have these guys um, who he was a consultant to, can't remember the name of their company either. Uh, let's make a whole bunch of different ones and see whether any of those work. But well, it is very, maybe it's possible it had nothing to do with the superconductor and just had everything to do with the helium going from one side of the chamber to the other, kind of like a shotgun blast created some sort of impulse wave that pushed hmm. pencils down, like, just like you do that with sound. Yeah, like the, it could be the Bose-Einstein condensate of the helium, not even the superconductor. That'd be interesting to play around with. The likelihood like, of you producing a Bose-Einstein concentrate, concentrate in the lab at the vacuums and pressures uh, and, and constituent parts uh, is highly unlikely. I'm sorry to break it to you, but 
producing you have, a Bose Einstein condensate is is done like in this volume. Oh it's, no, so with, with liquid helium here. <laughs> with liquid helium, you can produce bulk Bose Einstein condensates. Okay, how, how, this, uh, when you have superfluid liquid helium, that is yeah. a Bose Einstein condensate that's macroscopic. Yeah, uh, but so, in, in how are you going to engineer it into this power. kind of situation? You uh, would have to have helium-based cryogenic cooling on the disk to get it down to four Kelvin or so. And then if you have a helium vapor in the chamber, it would coat that surface potentially. Good luck, I say. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Good luck. Um, I agree, good luck, but it's not impossible. Like I said, we oh, talked to the Nobel Prize guy and he, he said it was possible if the pressure was high enough on the, on the helium. Mm. Plus your, the helium gas being close to the superconductor goes can go into a Josephson junction state so if it's close enough and that happens, even without it being cold enough, the helium could go, it could become superconductive from proximity to the superconductor. That's so, plausible. So, there, so theoretically, it can happen, but can it happen? That's the question. In hmm. fact, if you can see this white cloud of, of, both, of, of a helium gas on top of a superconductor of something that size, then you would, other than the liquid helium, you would have created more Bose-Einstein condensate than anybody else. And that would be itself, if verifiable, is 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 a Nobel Prize type experiment. Like there's a video of superfluid helium in a little container, then it flo flows up and around the side of the container. Yeah. Right. Uh, and, and, and if what was that? I thought that was like a. Roughly real scale, like a, a couple inches across or something. Yeah, sure. No. But is it a Bose Einstein condensate? People it's will a claim super it fluid. is. It's, it's a su super I mean, fluid. For, for helium. That's different. Anyway, getting back to this cloud. Go ahead. My, I, I, I do have one more question before you hold, if you could, um, before you move on. I, I am very interested. So he, he showed you how to make this disc that was a couple inches across and it didn't, it didn't shatter upon making it. It, uh, it held together. It was good. It was solid. Yes. Yeah, cool. I have it in the lab. Nice. We, we had to we had to grind it. Cool. Uh, well, so at least he at least he knew that much. At least he was not like BSing about oh, that. He knew how that. to make superconductors. I mean, if you read the Murakama's papers and uh, and the, uh, the original uh, George, if you still have those superconductors, uh, would you mind if we borrowed one? Because I have the option of trying with this setup, we could try any superconductor. We have a whole bunch of end plates. We could keep on changing <clears> them out with a new yeah, apparatus for each one. I can't. I can't guarantee they're going to be still good. We keep them in a vacuum, or sorry, in a dryer. Mm. Uh, but uh, they've been exactly in there for decades. Yeah, uh, yeah. Those those things need to be kept very. They're they're so, they're hygroscopic. Uh, George, uh, so, so so we were going on to talk about the cloud. The cloud. Oh, I still had one more thing before though before we move on. Um, do you mind, it, it, as best you can recall, uh, writing down those instructions that for, 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 for posterity? Uh, they would, they're in the, the previous, in, in the paper, yeah. um, the 19, was it 95, uh, Physica C paper by Hathaway, uh, Cleveland and Bao on uh, the rotating, the rotating superconductor. The, the formula is basically in there. So I was gonna say I've seen it. That's in Physica C, um, Hathaway. I can't remember the, the title of it, spinning spinning superconductors or something like that. Gravity. Perfect. Thank you so much. Um, anyway, you'll find it under Hathaway and gravity and Putkutnov. And anyway, yeah, even just uh, that particular recipe, like you could do as much as you want with the rest of the experiment, but like if you don't have that secret sauce. No point, like almost no point, maybe. Well, that's what Pukletnov claimed. Unless it was bilayer of a certain type, forget it. It's not going to work. Mm -hmm. Or at least yeah. the effect would be really uh, much reduced. Well, that's my that's what my intuition is but telling me as well. I would I would also suggest that this, I mean, I, I think I could make a cloud of of white stuff above a a suit a, a cold disc uh, quite easily in a bell jar. Uh, by letting in some kind of gas that condenses and looks like a cloud of white stuff. And it's nothing to do with heat moving or 
becoming a superfluid or a both saying condensate. Oh, he wasn't, he wasn't uh, saying it was glowing. He was saying it was. No, I, I sorry. It was a, a, a cloud, uh, presumably a reflective cloud. It wasn't glowing of its own nature. But I mean, he, I, he told I've, I've seen it. I've seen it was glowing. Okay. Because that's how he measured the speed of it. He put no, no. I, I'm sorry. I'm saying, it. I'm saying, without any high voltage or anything like that. Oh uh, yeah, I, I, you can because anytime sure. you have a cold system, the cond the condensates are in that chamber is going to, especially if it's atmosphere with the, it'll, it'll, the water vapors awake a white cloud until it turns to water. That's right, and that's I, I figured. I, I not at one, that is not at one, not at one millitor. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you don't need two heavy vacuum. No, that's true, but I don't know which, uh, some other gas might do it. Mm -hmm. I think it's superfluous myself. Well, nitrogen that, would probably be white too. At, um, yeah. At that. So there's a lot of gases that would ionize white. Mm. Uh, what Tony recommended we try is uh, we can vacuum the chamber and then let helium into it. Then vacuum it out again. Now we got low pressure helium with whatever's left. Uh, and just using like not the roughing quite pump. so fast. Uh, <laughs> if you simply do that, uh, you will have a huge amount of water vapor it's still left on the inside of any container you're trying to evacuate. The only way to get rid of the water vapor is either there. There are three ways: evacuating for weeks and weeks. Uh, evacuating and heating the surface. Desorption, right? Evacuating and uh, uh, backfilling with argon and putting a high voltage electrode in and sputtering using so-called plasma etching to get rid oh. of all of the uh, liquid, uh, all of the water vapor. Water vapor. Do you, do, you, do you think that's necessary though? Do you think Podklinov did that? I don't think Podklinov did that. I. But if, if you're claiming to do an experiment where you say, oh, all we have is helium in here, that's oh. not going to be the case. Well, I, 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 don't, don't... I don't think you will ever only have helium in there. And in Correct. Fact, I've argued the George, that George I think you are a better than scientist than Podklinov, probably. I didn't know shot. what he had in there. Well, I've had a long shot. Well, yeah, I've had a lot of experience at doing uh, liquid helium and high vacuum experiments down to 10 to minus 8, 10 to minus 9. And by God, that takes a week to clean out even the smallest container of... Uh, we of we achieved 10 to the minus 6 over here, and that's about the limit what you can do. Yeah, but that doesn't mean you got rid of... The water vapor sits there. And, and it also forms, if you read some of my uh, discussions about uh, measurement techniques, it forms pools of charge. Uh, called patch charges, and you're you're dealing with high voltage. You're going to have little patch charges where they're leftover water vapor sit, sitting on the side, even at ten to minus six. And they're do you going think to that be, would really have that much effect though on this experiment? I, I don't know. It's just this if you're writing a paper, sure. if you're going to write a, a scientific paper where you're going to have someone try to replicate it, uh, at least realize that this is a possible uh, artifact. Yeah. Uh, that and 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 it coats water vapor coats the inside of of superconductors too. You know, superconductors aren't monolithic. It's not like a, a block of aluminum. It's crystalline. Uh, it, it's it's crystals that are pressed together, and there are interstices. And water vapor, especially like hydrogen and helium, love to get in there and just sit. How much would you heat the surface to desorb the water? Uh, I can't recall what we did, but it was uh, probably just like 60 C or something like that for uh, under vacuum for, for quite some time. Could never get rid of it. Uh, whether it makes a difference, I don't know. I'm just saying that uh, it's think, something to keep in, keep in mind. Hey, George. Gotcha. Um, and I gotta everybody's go been talking again. about the voltage, but if you had to estimate the current or watts and watts in that experiment that you did, what would you estimate the order of magnitude of the amps and watts would be? Uh, it would be on the order of perhaps a milliamp or less. 
Uh, Van de Graaff machines operate at microamps. If right. Lucky. That's what I was getting at. And was yeah. there any other capacitors in the system other no. than the domes on the mic? No, no. My, my recollection from the paper, which I haven't read in a long time, um, was that he had a capacitor bank. Yeah, um, that was number three, where he used the, essentially a Marks bank. Yeah. Uh, a okay. cheapo Marks bank. Um, and I can't remember what the voltage was. I, I keep thinking a megavolt in my mind, but the megavolt is only, you know, you take yeah. this, this uh, uh, diode and capacitor stage of the, of the Marks bank and you have 10 of them. So you just multiply by 10 and you think, oh, that's my voltage. That's uh, generally not the case um, in, in a Marks bank, but it's, it's better than in a, in a Van de Graaff. Uh, yeah. But my, my, what I was getting at is in my model of gravity, which yep. you were there in 2016 and stuff when I presented, um, the, the effect that he's, I, that he's claims has everything to do with the DIDT, the amps and the amount of uh, pointing vector behind those amps as they travel across the gap milliamps isn't going to do squat right. right yeah i'm working on the same thing but a different kind of thing no no superconductor no um there's no superconductors there's no uh uh low temperature problem or anything like that i've got 10 of these high voltage capacitors and i'm gonna charge them up with the Van de Graaff generator, however slowly that is, to what they can handle. And then those capacitors are attached to this aluminum cylinder, which then becomes ionized. And then, so it, it becomes very highly charged and the air around it would become ionized as well. Um, in a vacuum, it would just have an electric field radiating off it. But inside, I'm going to have a spark gap. And when I reach the level of the spark gap switch, then as much of the current I can get out of those capacitors is going to snap across that spark gap. And all the charge on, on the cylinder is going to rush inside a, repul a repulsive electric field, which will push, push this along. And in a vacuum, what would happen is it would be ejecting a pointing vector of electromagnetic field in that direction. And then inside would be another pointing vector in the opposite direction, but I've got end caps to, tra to trap it so that that pointing vector can't get out and the momentum just carries the thing along. Okay. So yeah. It could be a propulsion device that works on that principle that, um, but yeah, I, it's in, in air, it could be a tic-tac type of propulsion, moving a lot of air very rapidly. Uh, in vacuum, it could lead to an ion type propulsion. Well, let, let me know if you have, if you, if you can scare up about $150,000, we can do it in the lab here in a va big vacuum chamber. That'll be next year. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, I'm gonna have to go in a couple of minutes. Thanks, Thank you, George. George, very much. But uh, any, I mean, email me if you wish. Uh, now you have, at least you can read the, the little paper that I wrote on the, the um, gravity beam experiment. And you can read the superconducting, the spinning superconductor experiment. You get the, uh, uh, the recipe uh, if you wish. See you, Gary. Yeah, uh, George, just one question. Um, do you think Potkinov was pulling your leg and making shit up, or did he see something and just didn't understand it? Uh, boy, that's Intuition. Long... Uh, I think he saw something uh, originally with the spinning superconductor. I, I think he and uh, some others, uh, because there was a, a, a push to make um, spinning superconductors into armaments or at the front end of armaments uh, in the Soviet Union to uh, cut down on uh, their visibility and all sorts of other stuff. Uh, so there was a set of experiments going on 
where superconductors were spinning and they were looking at the whether the Meissner effect was enhanced or not and, and what the uh, EM shielding capabilities were because they were hoping to put superconductors on the nose cones and uh, and, uh, and and there was uh, some idea about using them for EM shielding uh, so that the, so an EMP wouldn't mess up the electronics inside the missile. And they figured, oh man, if we forgot the missile was spinning. It, it always will spin basically, uh, uh, depends on what the missile is. So I wonder whether spinning superconductors are any good or maybe they're even better than non-spinning superconductors. So there was a history behind looking at spinning superconductors. And that may be why he can constantly said to me, I can't talk much about this. I can't tell you where it's from, but it's because uh, the military's clamped down on it. And that made some sense uh, given what I've just described. Um, however, um, his woeful knack, lack of knowledge about any other part of the spinning superconductor experiment apart from how to make the disc and what's needed, uh, you know, we need a field to levitate it. We need some fields to rotate it. Uh, we need to get it down to 4.2 or just, or between 4.2 and 10 Kelvin. Uh, you know, we, we need to uh, make sure that we see the you know, gravitational effects above it as, that was all arm waving. That's what we need, do it, just do it. Uh, so uh, from that aspect, uh, I had less and less, uh, uh, confidence in exactly what they had seen above their superconducting experiments. Certainly, if you blow smoke from a pipe over a cryostat, there's a convection current. There's always a convection current. So if they weren't knowing, if they weren't experienced in in doing cryogenic work, and some guy, uh, some major or something, came in with a pipe and blew the smoke over and said, holy shit, the, the, the smoke rises. I wonder whether that means there's an anti-gravity effect. <laughs> well, you have to be pretty dumb, I'm afraid, to, uh, to make that correspondence. Um, so uh, there, there are a number of really fishy things. Uh, but, but, the, but the impulse experiment, do you think that they actually were knocking over pencils? No, I don't think the impulse experiment was ever done, personally. I, I think I, 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 if, if it was done, it was the simple version with a Van de Graaff in a bell jar, the superconductor pasted on, and then, I don't know, someone rattled a, you know, I, I bumped into a, a table or something like that, uh, and the pencil rolled around. Uh, that, that's as, I, I can't give them too much credit for that. Um, and of course, just as the last thing, um, when I published uh, the paper in Physics to See, he immediately got back to me and said, you're working for the government. You're a government agent. Um, you're uh, a major in the uh, intelligence, in the Canadian intelligence service. And it turns out there was a major, Tom or somebody, <laughs> Hathaway of the same name, and said, I'm never gonna speak to you again uh, because you've ruined my reputation. You've ruined my experiment. Uh, this is a spinning superconductor. So I never, he never talked to me again. Um, and you, I, I get the feeling from that kind of response is that he's not a scientist in that case. And mm -hmm. he was trying to defend something that really was pretty dicey. Mm -hmm. Anyway, uh, I'm gonna have to Take sign care, off. George, thank you very much. Thank you very much, George. Hey, okay. hey George, George. Is that pa was that paper, paper published in 2003? Uh, Physica C? Yeah, because I got one here that's Hathaway, Cleveland, and a bio. And bio. Yes, that, that was it. That's 2003. Yeah, okay, so it was uh, later than I thought. I, I thought it was around 1999 or something like that. It, it's on ResearchGate, so y'all guys yeah. can find it there. Yeah, okay, send it along to those. Uh, just before you dash, George, can you yeah. and Mark work out a uh, possibility to, um, even if those superconductors you have are no longer good, perhaps, is there any way that uh, you guys could arrange to get them transferred over there to Hawthorne and so get at least send me an email. Email. Uh, I'll send you an email, George. Also the bank information. I need to, I need to pay you for the caps that you sent. We got to yeah, work that out. Yeah. Uh, please just send it, 
send a check, a US check by post, or I'll, I'll give you a, my FedEx account. Um, okay. But okay. Let's, I mean, let's do that. do that. Yeah. I think okay. I have a couple checks left, but yeah. Okay. Okay. Thanks. Bye bye. Thank you very much, George. Okay. Bye. Wow, that hey was guys. amazing. That was cool. I'm sending the Hathaway paper.